Dr. Moses Masika is our guest this hour, a virologist and also a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. He's here. Doctor, good morning. Morning, Do. How are you doing? I am very well. How are you? I'm all right. My goodness. Yes. It's been a while. It has been a very long time. And the last time you were here is when another disease was taking the world by storm. Yes. And here we are at the at the beginning of uh, who knows another one. But hey, um, it's good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you for the invite. Let's welcome you properly. Remember how we used to do it before? We still do it the same. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah. I, you know, you guys have not seen me for years, but I see you almost every week. So. Oh, well, see, that's a good thing. Yes. Yeah? I, I know your thing. Okay. <laughs> so at least I think so. <laughs> The one for today is interesting. Uh, so CC has proverbs and he's gone to Cote d'Ivoire this week. And then maybe tell us what you think about the proverb and how you'd interpret it. Sure. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to hearing what he has. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah, this is our final proverb from the uh, Republic of Cote d'Ivoire. When the finger knows not where to go, it goes into the nose. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Well, I see two things there. That if you have a tool that uh, you do not know how to use, you might just mm -hmm. end up using uh, using it just for whatever is you can do with it. But also, a uh, creature of habit tends to do what it, it, it likes to do. So <laughs> that's my view that uh, there's a, an element of habit and also an element of... Uh, Maybe lack of a plan, like when mm. you don't know what to do with something and you just do anything. Huh. Indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. I'm curious to hear CT your interpretation of that. Mm, is exactly like yours. <laughs> <laughs> That's very unlikely. It's very unlikely. Uh, the, the, the thing is this. Yes. <laughs> when one looks at a proverb, the reason why we ask our guests is because mm -hmm. we've realized the time. That's how we get to enrich the diversity of interpretations that you can possibly have because it yes. doesn't have one interpretation true it, it is meant to signify it's meant to communicate a message yeah. and that's that's why i wanted to hear yours because i suspect it's different <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> it means this in my opinion yes when you haven't planned specifically what you want to do you will engage in very mundane activities that perhaps may have no meaning Yes. Mm. Yeah. Like it's Friday and you don't have a plan. Okay. Someone calls you and tells you, Nani, to Nanda XYZ, Kule and Askia, Utenda. You had not planned for it. And it may be out of town, fuel, money, expense. Come Monday wondering, where that money of mine go? <laughs> <laughs> it went wherever it is you went on Friday. Because you didn't have a plan. Because you didn't have a plan. Mm. I agree with that too. So. Mm. Yes. Indeed. <laughs> okay. So we're getting into a conversation about where we know that plans then must be forged and must be followed. But let's start at the very beginning of this. And you're looking at this, and I think it's great from a pure science point of view um, in terms of what is happening Yes. Um, with MPOX. So we had, uh, we've seen uh, some information. We've heard warnings from the Ministry of Health. Don't spread information about this or don't give out any kind of opinions about this without facts and i think that's why we want to have this conversation today because we want to get some of the facts out there and share that information and knowledge so what do we know so far about mpox um and let's be kenya specific dr Terry. well the it's true that we need to only spread information that is useful mm -hmm. so it, because from what we saw with COVID-19, information is powerful and it can uh, pull apart or just basically disintegrate the entire plan for response. And I think MPOX, what we know is that it's a, what we call a zoonosis, which means a virus that is shared between man and animals. So it can be transmitted from animals to man or, and also woman and, mm. as a, and also backwards to animals. And, and for that reason, it has had a link with the wildlife for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and and um, over the last maybe four years, uh, it has then crossed over into humans at, at a serious scale. But that is not to say that the virus is new. Mm -hmm. The virus has been recognized for maybe five decades now, 
actually more in humans at least five decades mm -hmm. because it was first detected in the 50s late 50s in monkeys and hence the initial name mm -hmm. and then in 1970 a nine-year-old boy in drc was recognized to have it at that time it was important because people were mopping up smallpox mm -hmm. people the world was on the verge of eradicating smallpox mm -hmm. and people were looking at what uh, what could be the last pockets of smallpox and because monkeypox looks a, a lot like smallpox when uh, a nine-year-old boy in in drc which was then zaire um, Uh, presented with something similar it caused a lot of interest but in the country then today we've had a few cases i think four confirmed cases mm -hmm. and um other than uh, the fact that these cases um uh, we think have had a link with any of the other countries with the uh, um, monkeypox i do not have information onto their personal details or whatnot so i cannot really look at the risk factors that they have exposed them which would be important for us to interpret how they got exposed but i think we know the situation is that a lot of people are getting exposed through direct contact mm. and this direct contact could be a handshake a hug a kiss uh sexual contact um with somebody who is infected or with something that has been contaminated so it could be a towel it could be a, a surface like a, a seat or a table it could be um, a towel anything that could be contaminated mm -hmm. and personal items especially should not be shared like bed sheets and, and towels and also um there could be a few cases also of uh, other than personal contact also of what we call droplets as i speak or as i Uh, breathe next to you i expel some small droplets those droplets could have virus and that will then infect the person nearby um of course there were a few cases before uh, which we thought came from animals but right now most of the cases are being transmitted through human to human contact mm -hmm. uh, there's also a risk of passing this from a mother who is uh, pregnant to the child so that has been reported in a few cases mm -hmm. so these are the routes of transmission we know in Kenya there are already a few cases that have been confirmed a lot of suspected cases who are, have been ruled out which is a good thing mm -hmm. but we need to keep vigilant because the mm -hmm. fact that it's just across our borders and with a lot of connections socially with the, and also by trade with mm -hmm. these other countries if we are not careful of course we could have a similar situation as you know in DRC now we have uh, 20 20,000 plus cases Burundi has quite a number of cases and so this uh, being our neighbors and the fact that the disease is being transmitted human to human very easily uh, gives us cause for concern and uh, to be careful and to plan for it mm. when you say confirm what is it that must happen what is done what are the indicators of this confirmation so first Uh, what happens is that you present to a facility or to a healthcare worker with what they think is monkeypox there are symptoms that would suggest that and then they pick a sample from you there are several samples the best is a swab of the mm -hmm. lesions on the skin that is the most definitive and these are taken to the national public health lab which is uh, in nairobi but we now have many labs that eventually if they, there is need uh, that we are using for covid if there is need those can also be used but currently the national public health lab is the one that has the right reagents and the right skill to test and they do a pcr test mm -hmm. so that pcr test will confirm indeed whether what you have is monkeypox because there are things that look like monkeypox that uh, somebody could want to confirm is it's really a monkeypox or it's something else mm. what are these things that look like monkeypox the most interesting is uh, myasis myasis is uh, i don't know if you've seen the <coughs> flies that lay eggs into the skin of dogs it can also be in sorry excuse me <coughs> can also be in the skin of humans and also other places so they make a punctate or a, a lesion on the skin a swelling on the skin that has an opening mm -hmm. and that is very similar It's like it has an eye yes mm -hmm. because that 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 egg <coughs> that now becomes larvae has a spiral mm -hmm. or a breathing apparatus which then uh, is exposed for for the larvae to to Uh, breathe and that is what might look like the same lesions or the pox lesions but also there are other things like what we call chicken pox although they are very different viruses sometimes they may have lesions that look like um, uh, like it, a lesion is what a swelling a swelling yes, uh, yes. like a rash Yes. Mm. yes. Right. So yes. Mm. But they are, you can see that some of them are very different because even for monkeypox has very different rash presentation it can be mm. flat just a, like a change of skin it can then become raised which means it's swelling but it's a bit hard and then over time it may become uh, filled with fluid mm. and then that fluid may later become pus but if there's no lesion yes and yet somebody has monkeypox yes what is it that would 
you eventually take someone to hospital. Right. Yes. Now, there are many people who may develop monkeypox but uh, not have symptoms, especially where people have been exposed before in the DRC, because it, it means they could have some immunity to, to monkeypox. And also people were born, I think, before 1972. Eight in Kenya, we used to have people getting the smallpox vaccine. It's, it's mm -hmm. possible that CT is smiling with a reason that <laughs> that may offer some protection. But for most people, uh, they will who have symptoms, they'll have a lesion, even one, right. and it could be in places that are not easy to see. Mm. And if they have a single lesion, that may be sufficient to present to hospital because if it's in a, for, for example, in a situation where it in, in the urethra or mm. in, in the genital area where it causes a lot of pain, then they may go to hospital. But it's true there are people who may also get some a lesion in the hand and it goes without them going to hospital. Right. Yes. So right. okay. Um, because I'm I'm curious. Um, because of course people are avoiding any sort of panic. Yes. Uh, but it's important to understand um, the vaccines. Yes. Uh, because following what I have you know seen from research but we're glad you're here yes. we're looking at this vaccine that can be administered after a person has been in uh, contact with someone who has mpox we're looking at um, post-exposure prophylaxis and i just want to understand if we have that vaccine um, and what needs to be done maybe in as early as now yes if anyone can be protected uh, because this might be or is an outbreak in the making yeah thanks for that um, it's good to not at the outset that the vaccine we have is actually meant for smallpox. Okay. Mm -hmm. But because uh, mpox and smallpox are in the same family, they they present uh, an opportunity to for us to prevent them with a similar vaccine. And we've seen, as I was saying before, that uh, especially in the DRC, where this smallpox, monkeypox, has been circulating for years. I mean, from 2003 onwards, we've had at least 100 cases almost every year, mm -hmm. sometimes a thousand. So it was shown that people who had been vaccinated before were protected in a way. They were not uh, at a great as uh, a risk of infection with mpox, and that informed the choice for the world to use uh, the, M the smallpox vaccine to prevent uh, monkeypox or mpox. Mm -hmm. And what you're describing that people are getting as post exposure mm -hmm. is one of the ways to give this vaccine. It worked also for smallpox in the sense that if somebody here, for example, myself, I uh, get mpox, the people I've been in touch with are the first people to get vaccinated and that's called ring vaccination. The people mm. around me mm -hmm. and that protects you guys from uh, developing the symptoms and also developing the, the infection because it takes up to 21 days. It could be as short as four days. Mm -hmm. but it takes up to 21 days to develop uh, symptoms on average 10 maybe 12 to 14 days about two weeks okay. so that period of incubation that period before we develop symptoms is an opportunity for us to protect you using a vaccine and that is what has been used and the technique is called ring vaccination where you mm -hmm. look at people mm -hmm. who have been exposed and give them uh, and people they co so your contacts would also get the vaccine so mm -hmm. you can decide to go one or two or three contacts after exposure and that protects the people who may be exposed and that helps because you prevent Masika from then spreading in box <coughs> right. to, to, the, to his contacts. Okay, mm. so yes. why is it, it would appear as though um, uh, you can actually bring in some interventions that would then be able to sort out, you know, onward infection. But yes. let's look at some of the symptoms and what they are. Yes. Um, so that we know what it is that you, if you were to start feeling a certain type of way, then you know, okay, it's not just the flu that's going to pass by Monday, but what it is <laughs> that, you know, you're feeling. Yeah. Well, one of the things also to say is that the symptoms, other than the rash, are very, uh, you cannot really tell whether it's monkeypox because it could be something like a headache, yeah. a fever, uh, body aches, generalized body aches. Uh, some people complain of being extremely tired mm -hmm. and um, um, swelling of lymph nodes. CT, maybe you can tell me how to describe lymph nodes more easily. So, but usually these are the round... <laughs> Oh, round yeah. glands that are on the neck, <laughs> yeah. usually on the neck, mm. or behind the, the jaw, mm. below the jaw, and sometimes in the thigh, just near the groin, especially, if, for example, you mm. have a, an ulcer. Mm -hmm. So these, these are part of the body's defense system, and they mop up germs in mm -hmm. the system, and when there's something to mop up, they swell up. The, do, so, they have, do they feature also somewhere near the armpit? Yes, yes. Mm. They are in many parts, including the rest of the body, mm. but the ones that we tend to notice, yeah. Yeah, even the tonsils are part of that oh, system. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was going to ask yes. about that. Yes, mm. yes. Okay. So, so when that swells, that's also one of the signs. But really the most definitive sign we see is the rash. Mm -hmm. And the rash uh, uh, can also be very different. So as I was explaining before, the rash that we see that is caused by pox is one that is a swelling that is raised. Mm -hmm. 
uh, it could be a centimeter or, or less and it's uh, it has a, a hole in the center mm -hmm. like a, a dimple okay and so that is the classical lesion but there could be others where uh, you find just change in color, raised, uh, but had no fluid inside. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes the lesions are hard to find <clears throat> because some people have these lesions in the genital areas. So, for example, if you're screening people at the border and you're looking for lesions, unless you tell somebody to <laughs> strip down completely, mm -hmm. you may mm -hmm. not see them. Not see and them. so it could be that because the lesions start at the point of exposure. If somebody mm -hmm. touched, if I shake your hand and you have mpox, mm -hmm. my lesions will start on the hand that shook you. you oh. Oh. If, okay. if it's a, a lab person or a doctor who pricks themselves, mm -hmm. then the site of the prick is where the first lesion occurs. Okay. If it's somebody who got exposure through uh, sexual contact, mm -hmm. then the organ that they used for sexual contact, yeah, and this could be several, then that have uh, the first uh, <laughs> symptoms. It could be the mouth, it could be the genital area, the anus, the hand. So all those are seen. So depending on which part it uh, got exposed first. Mm, mm. It is also the uh, possible to have, as I said, droplets. And in that case, the oral area, especially the, the, mm. the, the, um, the throat, yeah. It gets uh, affected first and then these lesions may start, might start then from the face and then spread downwards. I, I know so we're talking they can occur yeah. anywhere. So I know we're talking about the lesion, but yes. it would appear though that uh, <coughs> it's most, most likely that uh, if one is infected with MPOX, yes. that you will have a lesion. Yes, not a hundred I mean, you said that, it, okay, yes, but most, most likely. People, it would yes. be the thing that would differentiate mm. yes. it between mm. that and just a common cold yes. or flu. Because with the flu, yes. you're going to have all these other symptoms that you mentioned. Yes. You will have the aches and pains, you'll have the yes. headache, a bit of a runny nose, whatever. Yes. So we're saying that the differentiating factor here is that at you somewhere, somewhere, yes. Yes. you will have a lesion and that's what would now cause you to go in and ask. For most people, yes. Okay. But that's also uh, to remember that there are people who will not have any symptoms. So they may have it and we will not know. And mm. they, they fight it because this generally is a self-limiting illness in the sense that within two to four weeks, you have cleared everything, no scars, back to business. Mm -hmm. So for most people, that is the case. But a few people may get more severe illness if it goes yeah. into the brain. Mm -hmm. and causes swelling of the brain, if it goes into the lungs, if it goes into sometimes even the eyes, uh, if it is in the genital area, because when things swell up there, you can imagine having difficult pee peeing or mm -hmm. urinating, so the urinary passages may become uh, quite inflamed and that causes a lot of pain, that will definitely take somebody to hospital, same thing to the anal region and also uh, other places which may swell up. So different organs may be affected. We're in a dangerous in world, don't we? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and it's not safe. <laughs> it has never been. <laughs> it's never <laughs> been. <laughs> and in fact, as Dr. Terry was speaking here, but we live regardless. It, it, you know, you know how Kenyans would get comfortable and say, "Ah, this is nothing close to COVID. You'll get better and go about your life." But I like that you've mentioned that it can get a bit um, extreme. Yes. And I'm just curious, what other effects would it expose the skin to? Um, yes, yes. You know past the cracking and falling off. Yes, that's 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 a very good point because a lot of people who have died in DRC are children. Mm. And what happens is that these lesions expose them to uh, other infections, especially mm. from bacteria. Yeah. Because the skin is your first defense. It, it protects you from other bugs. And so when the skin is broken, other germs get into the system and a lot of kids will die from those infections. Mm. So that means that we need to observe certain uh, people in hospital or especially when the lesions are generalized mm. uh, so that they do not... Uh, then go into this um, broken skin leading to super mm. infection with bacteria because that will cause them a systemic or a, a, a bigger illness in the body that can cause them to die. Okay. can cause their organs to shut down and eventually you die. A condition we call sepsis. Again, mm. I'm trying to mm. get a simple <laughs> word for it, but yeah. basically you have bacteria in your blood that right. causes your organs to shut to down. To shut down. Yeah. Oh. Okay. If, if we are not treated, of course it's treatable. So mm. that's the point yeah. of going to hospital. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I wanted to get to the treatment yes. and then, you know, some mm. of the interventions that are taken now to essentially sort because of, the virus, yes. you can only treat symptoms. It's going to mm. come and go, right? Yes, yes. But before that, and I thought it was very interesting to look at it from a, a, a virologist or doctor's point of view that if I present in hospital, what would they look at and say, okay, in this case, it's best for us to then test for MPOX yes. um, if we don't see anything 
beyond just that. if you keep coming back with those symptoms yes how yes. do i know that at this point i must mm-hmm. test for mpox like around the time uh, for covid everybody was sneezing coughing all over the place when you went into the, f- the first thing they're going to ask you is all mm-hmm. right let's do a covid mm-hmm. test right yeah. so then at this point where some people could be symptomless yes mm. you have one legion lesion somewhere a rash, yeah. or a rash somewhere uh, asymptomatic thank you how would a doctor at that point say okay let's rule everything out and let's test for 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 mpox i think this now comes in the training of the healthcare worker mm. because there's an element we call uh, suspicion mm. and even somebody without the rash you could take other samples especially from the throat because mm-hmm. that's one of the places that the virus is uh, really uh, multiplying a lot mm-hmm. and so depending on the exposures depending on what profession does this person do how many people are they exposed to in a day how do they inter- closely do they interact with these people then the clinician or the person seeing them they could then decide from a clinical point of view to test even if they have no rash Mm -hmm. and that is what uh, uh, healthcare workers are trained to do where we usually say that you need to have a a high suspicion index so that you know in certain situations what to look for so that's part of it but then it also means there are people who could slip through without being detected Mm -hmm. which is what happens in many of these viral illnesses that we don't routinely test for a lot of people just uh, get treated for a fever and they go home and mm-hmm. they get better but then uh, when you find uh, 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 um, somebody who is as you say in certain risk profile or certain um, uh, presentations then the healthcare worker can take a look and say this person let's test for mpox okay. but then most of the time now it's being tested based on uh, presentation okay mm. yeah because right. that's that's the biggest thing because then you have so many people with fever so many people with joint pain so many people with uh, lymph node or swelling swollen glands it's impossible to test all of them dr moses masika is our guest this hour and we're looking at mpox and what we know um again i think it's very important for us to keep saying here that it's not to raise the an, an, an alarm or to spread any kind of propaganda but it is important that uh, information of what we know um, should be shared and how we can actually protect and take care within no time dr masika if we're going to use covid because that was the one that kind of set the bar or set uh, a precedent for a lot of things that we did after when it came to disease control yeah. and uh, in no time there was erection of water canisters everywhere people were washing their hands there was sanitizer all over the place and people were spraying everything into the air to make sure that you are safe you touch something you spray it There's, you speak into a microphone you spray it and it just became a thing that in markets we saw water canisters everywhere and it just became everybody was aware um this also uh, a virus and pox but we've not gotten to the place whereby it has you know shaken everybody up to 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 want to start doing things like that but are we not just in a place whereby personal hygiene um whether you like it or not must be paramount especially when we're looking at the spread of viruses which of of which this is one yes i <clears throat> it's good you bring that parallel up because a lot of the things we did for covid-19 would help us in responding to mpox mm. and especially this uh, what should i call personal hygiene habits like washing our hands frequently making sure the surfaces that we're interacting with every day are are uh, properly cleaned avoiding sharing of personal items uh, things like towels utensils that are like um, not cleaned up properly so when you have um, uh, personal hygiene taken care of there are very many other infections you prevent not just mpox not just covid-19 a lot of common colds a lot of uh, diseases that cause diarrhea can be prevented just from hand washing and so that should be our way of life there are places that people for a long time now for decades so don't shake hands much or at all mm. uh, and of course that may not work for us here in, in Kenya and part, many parts of Africa because that uh, is sort of embedded in our culture but you saw during COVID-19 that going down a lot mm, mm, mm-hmm. so in terms of personal hygiene in terms of cleanliness in terms of simple measures that go a long way this is one of them mm-hmm. and washing making sure your spaces are clean mm-hmm. and that will prevent a lot of uh, spread the other thing that covid helped us to do was uh, to 
uh, set up a system of facilities, both lab and health facilities that would then help us if we need to isolate people, if we need to test mm -hmm. people for MPOC, so that helps us. And that is uh, still in place. Uh, it's just that, of course, we would need to obtain reagents for testing MPOX. So in terms of uh, drawing a parallel COVID-19, that is true. But also, besides <clears throat> what we did for COVID-19, the information now needs to be focused on MPOX. It, there may not be a concern, yes, but globally we've seen the old age, World Health Organization and Africa mm -hmm. CDC release what we call uh, a public health emergency of international concern, which uh, shows you the level of concern is, is high uh, because we saw... In 2022-2023, uh, MPOX spread to close to 120 countries, mm. uh, causing close to 100,000 cases. There were um, a few deaths, but then this shows you within two years, uh, a disease that previously had only been restricted in a few countries, DRC, a few cases in Nigeria, mm -hmm. uh, then spreading to so many other parts of the world in a very short time. That is a cause for concern because every time a virus is spreading, every time it creates a new generation of itself, mm -hmm. there's a risk for mutation. And that change mm -hmm. can make mm -hmm. it more effective in infecting humans. Mm -hmm. Because we know the earlier versions of MPOX were mostly transmitted from animal to human, mm -hmm. and they were not as efficient spreading from human to human. Okay. But the newer uh, variants, so the newer clades we are seeing, are easier to transmit between man to man or between humans. Mm. And that is a cause for concern because if we give it the chance to keep spreading, then there's no telling what could happen in future as the virus gets more, it changes more. Because every time a virus makes a copy mm -hmm. or makes copies, there's a risk that it will change. But yes. there is this subject that came up when we're dealing with COVID. Yes. Herd immunity. Yes. Now, is there any benefit to us being exposed to all these very dangerous microbes? Well, for, for COVID-19, what we saw is that, yes, eventually most people, even in Kenya, got exposed to COVID. Yes. But what the measures did was to slow it down so that if you have so many people exposed to COVID, you know a few are going to be extremely sick and they require hospitals. So instead of exposing 10 million people at once, you expose 1 million every month for 10 months. So that way you, you, you can treat those that get sick. But if you have all of them coming to the hospital, then you have you have yeah. more deaths because people who need mm. beds, people who need mm. oxygen don't get it. And that's, that is what helped us with COVID-19, that the measures that were put in place slowed down that exposure. Mm -hmm. So it occurred over years instead of months, and that reduced the number of people who suffered uh, especially severe illness and death because then we were able to manage better. Mm -hmm. Of course, we still lost a number of people, yeah. quite a number, which mm -hmm. was... Uh, 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 sad, but uh, mm -hmm. it, it shows you that if we didn't do anything, that situation would have been worse. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what do vaccines do exactly? So for MPOX, herd immunity might work better because then the MPOX does not change as much as COVID-19. We know that even if you got COVID-19 last year, you could still get it because it has changed so much. With MPOX, there's a good chance that if you got it before, if you got the smallpox vaccine, you're protected because the changes are much slower. They are uh, they, they, a virus does not change as much as the COVID one. Now, okay. for, for vaccines, yes, go, no, you go seem to have, <laughs> for vaccines, when somebody is given this vaccine, it introduces a part uh, or something that looks or similar to the to the virus, but not the virus, and that. Uh, whatever is introduced, we call it an antigen. Whatever part of the virus or part that looks like the virus is, not, is introduced makes your body respond as if you've been infected. Mm. It's like tricking the body to produce defense for an infection Antibodies. that is not there. Mm. Okay. And then the antibodies will protect you in future mm. if the virus comes knocking. Does it not also work if you are actually infected? Now, if you're infected mm -hmm. and you, you survive or you, you pull through the infection, you actually have good infec nice. uh, protection. protection. So, okay. Now, let me just yes. use a layman's yes. understanding of this. Yes. The more I'm exposed to diseases, the more I'm yes. exposed to these microbes, yes. the more I survive, <laughs> the better my yes, the better my immune system. That's a very good argument, but it only works in as much as you survive. But you do not know if who among us here, if we get exposed to mpox, <clears throat> will get brain swelling, for example, if at all. Mm. So you do not want to take that risk. Mm. It's the same way you can say, for example, um, if uh, we pick 100 Kenyans, and for example, all of them are infected with mpox, one of them 
might die. So instead mm-hmm. of exposing the 100 to mpox, we for example, give them a vaccine. If at this point I'm um, assuming that the vaccine is appropriate for them, that's another discussion. Mm. Then none of them dies, but all are protected. Mm-hmm. So it's about yes, you can get protected by exposure, but you do not want to risk the uh, uh, going to the extreme. Actually, exposure is not something you want. Yes, that's the whole thing. It's up a chance. You know, you you're going about your business. Yeah. Yes, yes. And 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 you get exposed. You're in a crowded mm-hmm. public vehicle. Yes. Or, or, or all these things School. that happen. Yes, yes. The, the reason why yes. I'm asking this is yes. because the predictions that were given. Now, this borders on the 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 the, 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 the frontiers of uh, conspiracy theory. It's good to discuss them because a lot of people are discussing. Yes, mm. yes, uh, yes. But I have to preamble it that way. Yes. Uh, that the predictions for this continent with regard to COVID that we're probably all going to die. Yeah. Yes. It or that we would be the hardest hit. Yes. 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 The complete opposite happened. Mm-hmm. Yes. And one saw the struggles we had with getting the vaccines, or the, the things that we're doing. And, and yet, we have countries that, that are far better prepared yes that's where people died like flies yes yeah. so there were el- several elements to that one is that initially when these predictions were being made we did not fully understand covid 19. and we or the people who were making the predictions i mean the world all scientists and everyone because it was being made very early but then later we observed that when covid 19 strikes there were certain people who are likely to die and these were people who are much older people with other infections mm. of the heart of the lungs uh, and other chronic infections and in, in africa we know the median age is 19 uh, as compared to many other parts where in the world it's 35 and above so that helped us a lot but more importantly there was very slow seeding meaning that Africa took a longer time for everybody to be infected as compared to other parts of the world. Yeah. For One is the interconnectivity. It's very poor. Today, or actually at the time when I checked, out of 100, um, 100 people in the air, 100, what are they called? Passengers in the air. Right. Only three were coming to Africa. So it means out of 100 corona COVID, COVID-19 cases in the air, only three might end up in Africa. You know the difficulties, for example, from here to from Nairobi going to some of the parts of the country. It's not mm. something you do every day. Mm. Some of us uh, travel to these places. It's a, it's a ceremony. So this <laughs> connectivity, uh, as compared to Europe, for example, where it's very easy to connect between cities and people are living uh, in cities much more than in, in the rural areas. The urbanization, basically, the number of people living mm. in urban centers is much higher. We've seen it play out. And it's also been seen with MPOX. As I said, with MPOX, uh, there have been outbreaks every year since 2003. But many of these are in a remote village somewhere in the jungle in the DRC. When this is limited to a small village, it doesn't get to a city like uh, Bukavu or mm. Kivu, another city, then it dies out because of the mm. poor connectivity. It takes, for example, where this uh, outbreak in Congo started, a place called Kamituga in uh, Eastern DRC, it's uh, probably the same distance from Nairobi to Nakuru, mm-hmm. but it will take you 37 hours to Kinshasa by road. Yeah. Mm. So that tells you the interconnectivity as really, the poor interconnectivity has protected us. Uh, in the past from MPOX mm. until it gets to the cities yeah. and then it spreads it out spreads. to the rest of the world. So Africa did get these cases. We did have mortality. That we, did, we, did not, we, act, we actually had deaths that were not accounted for years, but the thing that helped us was the slow seeding that the infections did not occur all at once. They occurred over time. And the latter variants were less, were not as severe as the first ones because they had gotten sort of a... Um, uh, um, weaker, not really weaker, but milder in terms of uh, but then, severity. But if they're mutating, it means yes. they have learned and they've... Yes. This, this living organism is yes. seeking to survive. Yes. So how does it adapt to a weaker self? That will guarantee that it's, it will it's, not survive. It's actually a smart self because let me give you an example oh. of uh, oral sores. You've seen the things that people get on the mouth. Oh, yes. If you are to guess how many Kenyans have it, how many have it? I know one. But very few die. What actually, maybe 80%. What do you call cold sores? <laughs> cold yes, sores. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe 80%. Now, that virus is very smart because it infects you for the rest of your life. It doesn't kill you. Mm-hmm. What gives that an opportunity to transmit to many other people? It's a happy virus. To transmit to many other people. But if a virus... That means it will, you'll have more cases of it. But if a virus is killing you in three days, five days, then it means it will not be transmitted to many people. 
first you're very sick so when you're very sick people stay away from you and uh, you also know you are not interacting with so many people you are maybe bedridden and so the viruses that are selected is natural selection the viruses that are selected are the ones that are transmitting easily but are not killing very fast because if you kill very fast you have a shorter period to infect other people mm. all right yes. uh, I, i'm seeing there's a quote by wayne Dina dyer saying a virus has three purposes to duplicate to infiltrate and to spread from one host to the next just what you're saying yes. but he continues to say ultimately even a single virus can shut down an entire system this is where i'm going with this yes. i know we have vulnerable citizens in this yes. country humans yes. for that matter yes. children yes you imagine during covid 19 how we had to make sure that schools are adjusting very quickly to ensure that these children who hardly understand what exactly is happening Yes. are protected i appreciate the vaccine you talked about the chicken pox and uh, etc uh, vaccine is it is it smallpox small, small yes, yes, yes. uh but now the the concern i would ask is uh as a lay person yes because people are concerned you know like when you have homer let me just say homer yes, <laughs> yes people say oh don't play in the cold yes. uh, it might make it worse the yes, is, please yes. don't take too much sugar yes. avoid cold areas or if it's too hot etc yes, yes. do you think that regions in the country yes um that was sudden weather patterns that you know would propel this virus uh, multiplication or anything of the sort if it's a myth then you can also let us know that it is just a myth and clarify that kind of conversation to I'll, us I'll, and, the, and the listeners i'll split your question to one is yes. whether it's true common cold viruses mm. replicate yeah. faster in the cold and it's true because different viruses require different conditions to make copies Mm -hmm. So common cold viruses will replicate when it's cooler and that's why they're in the openings in the mouth and the breathing uh, passages where are you breathing in cold air. Yeah. So when the air is colder, mm -hmm. usually we say it's around 33 degrees Celsius and our body is 37. So that then increases their multiplication. But for mpox, mm -hmm. that is not the main driver. For mpox, what we are seeing is that anybody gets infected because of contact. So mm -hmm. if you come into contact with somebody who is infected, then that is the only risk. It doesn't matter the weather because this mm -hmm. virus is being seeded directly on your, in your on your skin or other organs. It could also be the lining of the mouth or other parts of the body, then it will multiply whatever uh, temperature unless you are protected by some previous like say smallpox vaccination mm. in 1972 like city so <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the, I've heard him. The, yes. <laughs> the, the, the point here is that the temperature will not really protect mm. you it's the other measures that you take so well, everyone ought to be vigilant everyone ought yes, to do yes. what ought, you know mm. take care of yourself wash your hands your hygiene yeah. and um, avoid contact with the yeah. people who may be infected mm. there are also measures for people who are infected they should take but also for the individual <clears throat> having the right information to know that you can get this through a person who is infected through um, sexual contact kissing mm -hmm. through handling animals although in kenya we haven't seen so much in animals and also uh, through droplets uh, like if i'm speaking close to you it could be two three meters yeah then that is that you know having that information then you take yeah. you take measures mm. to protect yourself mm. speaking of information i am yes. very big on this yes. um it's we are lucky to have you listen to you in english and sometimes read kiswahili <laughs> i'm curious because there's so yes. many other kenyans who are watching and all they know how to speak is their vernacular your yes. lecture as well yes. so it, as a kenyan yes. now i'm not asking you because of your medical background yes it, you you know when COVID happened, not not there was a lot of speculation, misinformation. We don't want to do the same thing, and that's what MOH is saying. Do not spread panic. Yes. We need to get this information to the grassroots. Yes. To the woman in Rarieda. Yes. <laughs> okay. You yes. know, yes. <laughs> for example. Yes. Um, what do you think? You know, uh, or how do you think we're doing as, as a country? Um, besides just having you on Spice FM today, and what better way should this be done? Uh, one plus is that over the last five years, I think, even just pre-COVID, mm. we've had a lot of the uh, mainstream media having dedicated desks to science and health, which is a good thing. Okay. But a lot of these, as you say, are in English, some in Swahili. Mm -hmm. Then what I've seen also a few in vernacular, but I'm not so sure how far they go because then I don't understand uh, all the vernaculars, maybe just one. So I think that focus into having first the ministry's messages, because the ministry has released clear messages. You can see them on Twitter. I've seen mm -hmm. some even on KBC. Having those translated into different languages. I, uh, we saw the Gen Z movement translate uh, 
uh, what was this uh, document they translated in so many languages? The, the finance, finance, the finance bill. bill. Yes. Yeah. So we could have very short messages, I think, that are also translatable. It's it's difficult. For example, I was trying to find out the name for smallpox in different languages. I don't know yeah. if you guys know it in your languages. One of the names I was given is Amachonjoro, huh? which which stuck. I think it's a Nyore word. But I know the other languages that have it. And the because, viruses. Because the virus, mm. the mpox itself being new in Kenya, will not have a a tradition a, a vernacular name mm. it's 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 a uh, it's not existed before mm. but you have similar names that we can use to explain it so i think that uh, uh, that 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 effort needs not just to be left to mainstream media but also to other people like us who are uh, tend yeah. to struggle a lot to translate our science and english into <laughs> vernacular into english the vernacular so language, language I, might be I subscribe to yes had an <laughs> encompassing word that described elements that could not be understood clearly mm. yes yeah mo. <laughs> uh, how would you translate it to English? Yeah. The wind. The wind. Yeah. Oh. Yes. 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 When somebody's afflicted with the disease and they yeah. don't quite know it, they're not this yeah. one is the hey. wind. That's interesting. That's actually very interesting because in my language as well, <laughs> the word for virus is something that passes in the air. Okay. And this in this case it's actually true that mm. uh, you can through droplets which is like droplets are a bit heavy so they may not go beyond 5 meters mm. so, but they are somehow in airborne for a few. Okay. For, Let's look at some treatments that you know interventions right. that are made for you know the virus. Of course we know with the common cold you treat the symptoms you treat the headache you treat yes. the sniffles etc. Uh, but for this what happens and where we look at you know and from what you've said you know um treatment manageable but at the same we can actually recover yes uh, from the virus we're not looking at you know high percentage or likelihood of death like in ebola for example yes yes uh, but so what treatments are available do you sleep in hospital can you get a dose go back home what kind of thing happens so, and also if does does it recur okay yeah, yeah. so yeah, i think that was one question that's come up from yeah. the comments that we've yeah, seen this yeah. morning that can you get reinfected yeah uh, with with mpox generally we haven't seen cases of reinfection mm -hmm. again because uh, recurrence occurs for viruses that mutate so much more that they change and by the time they come back like common cold viruses and corona they change so much by the time it goes around and comes back to it's a different animal but for mpox that has not been observed i think uh, we can't rule it out in cases where somebody has very weak immune systems weakened by the drugs or weakened by other conditions in the body then in that case because you have lost your defense it could recur yeah. but that's not generally true for most people now the management is good to know that going to hospital helps most conditions even for ebola initially that had 90 percent killing rate yeah when you go to hospital that is reduced to like 30 percent so it's deadly yes but going to hospital and getting the right management helps to reduce your risk of death uh, mpox will be self-limiting in a sense that within two to four weeks you have healed completely almost mm -hmm. but going to hospital helps you first to get the right information to get tested to confirm and also to isolate or guide you in how to protect the people you care about and the people you're interacting with so you will go to hospital uh, you go into hospital will help you and the people around you and what you will get when you go to hospital is supportive care supportive care means you have fever you get treatment for fever you're in pain you get treatment for pain if you are any of your lesions are infected by any other uh, bacteria then that could also be taken care of especially for children and if you need advanced uh, management especially for the complications like we said if it gets into your lungs in your brain into your eyes into your uh, urinary passages then you get treatment for that there are antiviral agents that are specific to smallpox that uh, have been tried for mpox they have been shown to have some benefits in some cases but it's not guaranteed that in this current outbreak that they'll be useful but i'm sure that could be explored when it becomes necessary there are a few drugs that have been used before to treat smallpox that people think may be beneficial to mpox but especially when started early but those are not the main uh, option for us now the main option for us now is supportive care where we treat the symptoms to make you comfortable and also manage you so for example if somebody today has those lesions they advise to stay at home in a room where they don't interact too much with others mm -hmm. avoid breaking the lesions because when you break them you could iris you could you could release the viruses into the environment and mm -hmm. into the people around you also um, uh, 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 people taking care of you need to make sure they are protected either using gloves or even a mask and yourself you should also use a mask so that you don't mm. drop uh, you, have, you don't release any droplets to the people around you mm. so the main thing is to have this information that even as you're on treatment you need to be isolated until all the lotions all the all the rashes have 
uh, scar, scabbed off and the scabs have fallen off so that you're no longer infectious. Uh, could I speak for expectant mothers? Um, there's yes. this fear of, I don't know, what is the connection between, I mean, uh, is it anything that might happen to your child, uh, stillbirths, etc.? Or what is really the concern? What should expectant mothers know? Yeah. Um, so first uh, of all, for people who are... Uh, for most people who are healthy, mpox will probably clear off. But mm -hmm. for specific people, especially pregnant mothers, very young children, and uh, people who have weak immune, weak immunity, they are at risk of the most severe forms. Mm -hmm. So that is one thing. The fact that you're pregnant may expose you to the risk of most severe illness, and there's also a risk that you may transmit the virus to the child. Mm -hmm. So I'm that. Born? Yes, oh, in, okay. in the fit, okay. the, the child in the in the uterus. Mm. So the unborn child. So for you to do well, to protect the child or to be advised on what to do, you then need to be at hospital so that both the mother and the fetus can be uh, monitored. Mm. Yes. Okay. I think the overriding message here that we're hearing is that uh, for prevention, cleanliness and hygiene is key. Um, just a, a couple last words from you, uh, Daktari, in terms of what we just need to watch out for. I don't think we are at alarm status. I know that there were colors that were being given at some point, yellow, orange, red, <laughs> you know, um, but uh, for Kenya at this point, even with the high passage we're, we're seeing in and out, there's vigilance that's being done. MOH has put in, I think, certain safeguards already. Yes. And we may not be seeing, you know, huge messages across board, but um, there's still the vigilance that has been set up. But yeah. then one thing that individuals and communities can even start to think about, what will some of those be? Yeah, I mean, it's good that the ministry is uh, taking measures to protect us by screening people at the borders and mm -hmm. also setting up systems for managing this. That's good. The people now individually, you need to know that your exposure comes through interacting with many people. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, if it's sexual contact, that needs to be kept in mind that you, the more sexual uh, partners you have, the greater the risk. If you are interacting with people, are traveling a lot, uh, interacting especially in the hospitality industry, they need to take measures to make sure if somebody is exposed or infected, then you are not, uh, you reduce the risk of infection. So if, for example, you give the incidence of um, um, uh, washing hands, mm -hmm. but also those handling like linen or bed bedding yeah. and other personal items, especially in the hospital, industry should take care as they do that. Maybe use uh, even gloves as they clean them. Mm -hmm. People in the healthcare sector who are handling the patients, who are, who are especially collecting samples or specimens, treating them, caring for them, including people who are caring for sick people, also need to take measures to protect themselves. themselves. Yeah, but generally we need to keep in mind that this disease is through close contact with mm -hmm. others, and so we need to take be mindful of who we interact with closely. Indeed. Yes. Dr. Moses Masika, a virologist and research scientist, thank you for being here with us this morning. Very um, great insights into just taking care of ourselves and seeing you know, what will happen in the future, knowing that whatever happens, we can all be protected. And so this information is very important. Thank you for being here. Talk again soon in the near future, hopefully not too far like the last time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great. probably because you guys always invite me when there's a virus. It's, right. better, it's better when it's far apart. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. Good morning. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day.